there's a community feeling that this is a nice thing for us to have, right? Um, there are also conversations about uh, that as we come out of lockdown, there should be a reduced number of vehicles on the roads. Uh, and uh, some states or cities had implemented the odd even thing and had get, in fact painted colors on, the, on people's uh, uh, license plates. It could be possible that coming out of this uh, uh, area, that there could be a simple policy that city level and stuff would say, listen, you know, there could be the odd even to anywhere reduce traffic, but electrics are allowed. So can so that this would enable buses, rickshaws, autos uh, to ply all the time, and there could be an incentive for people to look at it. And there's also feel good factor today that this makes an impact. So can we leverage this uh, when when it's people don't see it's a big impact because anyway a lot of them are not traveling every day. So I believe there's an opportunity um, to the right time to put in uh, policies that people. Uh, can move go, going electric on this area. So reinforcement at a central level on EV policies, reinforcement at a state and a city level uh, around the policy direction could be a great time. Um, the fact that the uh, renewable energy could be linked to mobility uh, could be a very good time to put it right. So Delhi was talking about that, uh, you know, if stations were there, you could use distributed stations to connect to renewable energy. Right, which means uh, if the new infrastructure coming about uh, can directly be connected to renewables and that policy enables that, uh, then swapping stations, fast charging stations, or right from day one could be on a clean grid, right? And, and this could again allow us to look at it. So I do believe there's a huge opportunity if we put some you know, policies in place um, because there is also a challenge from the other side that the economy has been hurt and so the first goal is get the economy right. But there are opportunities to get the economy right in a sustainable manner if these policies come through. So, um, you know, it needs some effort while, yes, everyone's focuses on areas of getting normal place. Sometimes you need to take a step back before you go step forward. And this allows us to move back and review it and correct things, right? So I'm hoping that, uh, and I agree with you, I'm hoping that this can be an opportunity for us to rethink and, and, and look at it when public is also very positive about this point. So I think when I look at India, unlike the West, you know, 85% of our people go to work and back in two wheelers, three wheelers and buses. And there's a growth of the shared economy. So like the West focuses on cars and postal mobility, India needs to focus on shared mobility and two wheelers, three wheelers and buses. The challenges we face in getting these forms of transportation to be electric on this area is the fact that uh, the, the cost these vehicles are very high because the proportion of the battery cost is extremely high up to 50% on this area, right? Um, and the second part is people are very concerned about range anxiety. What if I run out of charge? And you know, their two-wheeler does everything for them, right? The three-wheeler can you know, one day do 150, one day do 100, and so they are concerned that what happens if I run out of charge? And the third thing is that the regular infrastructure today uh, you know, allows you to charge in five to eight hours. And fast charging allows you in one hour, but has an impact on the life of the batteries. And so therefore, uh, it's important that you address this issue on, um, um, on uh, long refueling time. And consumers' mindset is that anything over five minutes is eternity because they're used to five minutes refueling. So our feeling was that unless you address these three issues, you're not going to have electrification at scale, right? Um, and so by separating the batteries from vehicles, you can get the cost of an electric vehicle to be similar to an internal combustion engine and the cost of energy to be cheaper than gasoline and the cost of maintenance to be 40% lower. So then you can get the total cost of acquisition to be lower and the total cost of usage to be less, right? Also by swapping in one minute, uh, which we can do, you're addressing the issue both on range anxiety and on long refueling time. It's actually faster to swap than it's to refuel with gasoline.
today or with CNG on this front, which takes maybe 10 minutes to do sometimes on this area. So now you're telling a consumer, listen, no change in your habits, right? Um, no change in your purchase decision, right? And the third part consumers are very concerned about is the warranty on batteries. You know, they see the cell phones die very quickly. A lot of the OEMs and two and three wheelers are giving one year or two year warranty. Guys saying what happens in five years or three years? And, and when they understand the price, the battery is 50% the price of the vehicle, they're scared that what if the battery fails? So providing battery as a service removes those anxieties from them because they always get a battery which is always working well. Like it's like your gas cylinder has changed for you and it's always going to give you a certain amount of energy. And so these concerns are addressed and this is what's going to really uh, move on this area. So our idea was that battery swapping becomes an enabler and our focus has been on the two-wheeler, three-wheeler and buses on this area. So I think there, uh, there needs to be a higher level at the education side on, on electric mobility, uh, which has slowly coming in the last maybe two years, but still there's a big gap, right? And, uh, and this needs to be coupled at the education level with the access to a lot of projects. Um, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the idea of, uh, well, more than that, 30 years ago, I guess, on the solar car side, idea of doing solar cars and hybrid cars uh, gave me a, a, a very strong uh, a, a motivation that this is what I want to do and two, gave me learnings that I could never gotten uh, in college. And today you have programs like SAE, uh, Electric Baja, you have some solar car projects, you have Formula SAE. These need to be at a much larger scale. So there's an experience for college uh, graduates or college uh, of, of what it means to go electric and a curriculum that does that. The second part is a large amount of training um, that is needed um, for people who are already in the, in, uh, in the industry or just graduating. So you almost need finishing schools uh, for say three months or four months that get people uh, you know, updated. If you think of the 90s and look at how well we did on the IT boom, you had, you had these little schools everywhere teaching anyone how to get it, right? So we need to do this at scale, right? And electrics are slightly more, are much more complex because they are a combination of mechanical, electronics, and software, which is often termed mechatronics. And the training of mechatronics is not very strong on this area, right? Traditionally, people say, I'm an IT engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. Actually, when you work on electric vehicles, you need to be an engineer who understands I have to code and I have to do mechanical and electronics because they're all integrated. So this kind of knowledge uh, and uh, companies looking at it this way, getting finishing schools could probably help tremendously on this. And the third part is then you need a training of the, the operation level on this area, uh, which would say that, you know, how do people man manufacture electric vehicles? How do, you, how do you service electric vehicles? How do you install charging station in the new infrastructure? So there need to be um, at a technical level on this area, uh, more effort put in. So you have a trained workforce, like today people know how air conditionings work and how plumbing does. We don't have a training program clearly for electrical and electrical infrastructure. Uh, you're using high voltages in some cases, uh, a lot of safety norms have to come in, right? Training also has to be done for infrastructure people, right? Um, uh, you know, fire tenders need to know how to deal with emergency situations when electric mobility comes in. So there should be an ecosystem training uh, on this area, right? And uh, um, I think these are three things. I haven't talked the fourth one, which is, which is a little bit separate, which is the amount of research that has to be done and research institutes that have to be created. Um, we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of that happening at universities. We don't have that enough of happening as individual organizations on these areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, we almost need a little bit of COE's sense of excellence in the country uh, to look at it, right? Uh, uh, they need to be a combination of, 
of government and um, uh, industry putting together um, to, to look at uh, that there is a center of battery excellence, there is a center of motor excellence, there is a center of electronics excellence. And this allows a um, combination of, of research and development and knowledge sharing to happen, right? And the US and China have done a very good job in doing these kind of excellence centers, sometimes integrated as separate institutes, sometimes integrated with universities, with public-private partnership. So this allows us to build up the the, I would say the research component um, and, and bring that uh, between sync between academia and industry um, that's probably uh, going to need on this front, right? And um, um, uh, the last thing is, you know, at a policy level, um, there isn't a single window of looking at it. So the environment ministry believes this is very critical. The, uh, the, uh, our ministry says, oh, we need to figure things out because it's going to affect our infrastructure, right? The, um, um, uh, it, uh, you know, science and technology says we should be promoting technology for electric mobility. The new and renewable industry is saying, well, this used to be part of us and we need to think of this. And the um, um, heavy industries ministry in which the automotive industry comes in the same policy is putting some policies. In reality, when you look at a, such a complex thing, you're actually putting all of these together, right? If tomorrow vehicles have to give back energy to the grid, it needs the smart network, smart grid, and a policy and power, right? Um, if you're linking up, so, so there isn't what I would call when such, thing, when such thing is so large, there isn't an integrated policy making area, right? If the policy is driven from one department is highly focused on a portion of it, but is not holistically looking at what is needed at a country level to have transformation, right? If India by 2030 went all electric, right? And, and uh, we would need maybe 250 gigawatts of renewable energy, which is probably half of what we look at, but is there policy that's linking that to mobility and how are we thinking the bigger picture? So I think the other last play is that can there be think tank around integration of policy that starts to look at this holistically. Now, in many ways, Niti Aayog has taken some of these roles, right? But there's a gap, I would say, between, um, between the thought process and the implementation at the ground level. And, and if there is this kind of policy-making direction that is doing that, and I think where successful countries like China have done this very well, and so therefore they were able to put this this vision at the top level all the way down. And this really grew that. So I believe that's the other area that I think would come in. So it's more than three, but they're, uh, they're in other areas too, which I think are very important. Yeah, so I think that, um, uh, the the uh, one of the areas is what I look at is what is the you know holistic impact of energy and mobility in a city, uh, and that can give policymakers a direction of connecting the two dots on this area, uh, and what would that impact be if a city went that way uh, in in three years, five years, seven years from today? This can give policymakers a clarity to say you know we could actually reduce our cost of energy for consumers. We can actually reduce this kind of a pollution level. And we could bring in policies that say that renewable energy can be used in mobility and this could be the impact. I think that is one area where there is a lack of awareness um, and impact. Um, and, and these are easy, simple decisions because you know, people can invest in this area and the government doesn't have to do it, but the awareness of what it is or the loop or the concerns of closing some of the bridges to do that. That could be one area. Uh, the second area is there have been, you know, a lot of also successes in India. How do you emulate that area? So how do we take learnings of things and say, what would this mean on other fronts? Uh, for example, uh, uh, if uh, a certain battery swapping solution, another solution has worked or bus has worked in a certain way, how do we take those learnings and and translate them to other areas to say, what could this mean? How, is, how could cities rethink their policies to enable this to happen, right? 
Um, and, and the third is a, a set of, uh, you know, um, policy drivers that, that are working in some cities uh, that could go across. But there are some real world challenges in making that happen. Let's give you a couple of examples. Several cities have said they are banning uh, IC engine three wheelers. Kerala has taken a direction, Chandigarh has taken direction. But when such things happen, there are also other challenges around that area, which are more real. So as companies, as cities are changing policies to bring green, there is a big gap in the policies in, in, in local things between uh, a union issue or another thought thing or other parts. And these prevent um, uh, the, the super high adoption on this front. Again, if this is understood and researched and to put a policy framework to say, if a city is going this way, what are the things it should consider? How would they look at it? Why wasn't this very successful here? And what are the learnings we should take? Uh, I think these would help get best practices. I think today a lot of policymakers want to move in this direction, but they don't have good informed decision um, uh, and they don't have complete technology neutral decisions. The policy making should be technology neutral. You know, it should encourage, in, let's take the infrastructure, it should encourage fast charge swaps, low, you know, slow charge, all of that. Everything's going to coexist, right? And so, therefore, it's important that policymakers understand the coexistence of multiple technologies, that different consumers will use different technologies. A guy, a scooter who drives at home will use different than a three wheeler. And these awareness is also lacking. So, I do believe these are, you know, some of the roles that they can play, right, on this area. The other part, I do believe that there's a potential of disrupting how shared mobility. Um, can come into cities with electrification. And, and I've seen over the last few weeks in my conversations with some of the leading e-commerce players and others, there's a huge interest for them to go electric, right? Uh, and, and, and they all want to do it. There's a, and I think this intention is there. I didn't think this intention was there 18 months ago, right? It was all about how do we, the intention is there to go electric and save money, but the intention is there also to go electric. That, that consumers would like this to this area, right? How do we start to create, you know, models of, of you know, um, of shared mobility in cities uh, where a combination of players come together to make it happen, right? So you see an interest from Uber to go electric, from Ola to go electric, from a Flipkart, from an Amazon, from a big basket, from all of them, right? right? And other players are Yulu and stuff. But what it is, is they're all happening in pockets. Right? What is the vision of shared mobility in a city for goods and people transport? How can infrastructure be co-shared and further reduce costs right? and other systems? So I believe that areas like this, because I think these are areas of early market entry and, and simple policy changes or uh, pushes can help do this. And they can be areas where people start to experience mobility and then use forward. So some, just some thoughts, and I think anyway, WRI and others are playing a very important role. I've seen a lot of the studies you've published, and, and, and I think that's been very informative, but I do believe there can be a larger role going forward um, in this area.